I told you earlier, we uh, started a series that we're trying to do in three uh, messages that uh, I originally preached in seven messages. So I'm condensing the contents and uh, trying to get it all in this weekend. And uh, we talked about uh, God creating man, putting Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and how that he had a, a relationship with them there when he came and walked with them in the cool of the day. And uh, that uh, that is uh, God's plan, that he had a plan when they sinned and fell from that relationship. God had a plan even before he created man. We showed you that God had a plan in the beginning. And uh, so when it came down to the point of them sinning, and, and I want to go back and read to you out of Genesis 3, chapter uh, 3, starting with verse uh, 14 and 15. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shall I go, and dust shall I eat all the days of my life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Here the Lord begins in prophecy to say, I've got a plan. There is going to be a man born, said his, his heel. So there's going to be a man born of the seed of a woman. And... Uh, he begins to reveal his plan for the restoration of the relationship between God and man. So let's uh, look at Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5 real quick. Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5. And when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, I could spend all afternoon right there on those two verses, but I can't. I don't have that time. But when the fullness of the time was come. You see, Jesus was not born one minute too soon or one minute too late. He was right on time. Right on time. And I want to tell you another thing is that when God moves in your life, he is not a minute late or he's not a minute early. He's right on time. It's his time, not our time. We want God to move on our time. We want God to move when we want him to move. God moves on his time. Amen. 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 We have to get used to that. Amen. So, the birth of Christ we find in Luke chapter 1. We find the account of the Virgin Mary and the angel Gabriel. Luke 1, 30 and 33. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. My. Hallelujah. Here's the young virgin Mary. An angel appears to her. And he starts talking about this. Can you imagine what was going through her mind? She said, how can this be? Knowing that I know not a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, in verse 35, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Hallelujah. And the seed of the woman, 
seed of the woman, there was no man involved in Mary's pregnancy. God took the seed of the woman and implanted the word in her. Because we found out that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And he became man and was manifested and our hands touched him. We read that to you last night. We won't go back and read all that. But I have a message sometimes I preach impregnated by the word. See, the angel told her what was, and her next word was, be it unto me according to thy word. According to thy word. You see, we need to be impregnated with the word. Amen. 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 We need to be willing to say to the Lord, according to thy word, be it done unto me. According to thy word, be it done unto me. That's where a lot of us are hung up. We've never got to that point in our Christian experience to really give God all of us. We want to hold some of it back. We want to control part of it. But we need to give him full control. Mary gave God full control when she told the angel, Be it done unto me according to thy word. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, we know that she became pregnant. We know that the baby was born in Bethlehem. We won't go all through that. We're going to fast forward. <laughs> 30 years. And let's go to Mark, the first chapter. Mark begins writing his gospel. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not some other gospel. This is not about somebody else. Mark says, the beginning of the gospel of of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ was in God's plan for the restoration of the relationship between God and man. Without Jesus Christ, the relationship between God and man cannot be restored. Okay? Amen. Mark 1, 2, and 3, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Then Mark introduces us to John the Baptist. Verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. John comes along, and John starts revealing the change that is coming in the relationship between God and man. There is an Old Testament, and that records what the relationship was between God and man in the Old Testament. Then there is a New Testament. There is a new contract. God deals with man in a different way in the New Testament than he dealt with man in the Old Testament. Amen. Amen. Yes. It's all in God's plan for the restoration of the relationship. <coughs> he reveals two things. Repentance. How many of you know what that word means? How many of you have heard it in church lately? Not too many churches preach repentance anymore. But John began to preach repentance. Repentance brings about the remission of your sins. Repentance means that you have come to the conclusion and the thought process in your mind that you realize that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. And you need to repent of the sins that you've committed in your life. <coughs> you can't become saved without coming to the point of repentance. 
You have to repent to receive the remission of sins. Amen. God just don't automatically remit your sins. You have to do something. You have to repent. You have to come to that conclusion that you are a sinner. There's no way that you can work your way into heaven. There's nothing you can do to go to heaven in your own power. The only way to heaven is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No other way. You know, I talk about that sometimes. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I don't care if I'm politically correct or not. Amen. But we can't get the world saved without telling them the truth. And the truth is, Jesus is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And if people are going to receive a remission of their sins, they're going to have to come through Jesus. Amen? Amen. Sometimes I, when I'm preaching that, I say to them, I'll say, you know, when you were raising your kids, I'm sure that every parent in here, how many we have in here today has got children? Just about everybody. Somewhere along the way, you probably made this statement to your child. What is it about the word no you don't understand? The N or the O? That's what I say to people about that. What is it about the word no you don't understand? It says no man cometh to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said. Amen. No man. No man. What do you not understand about that? No man cometh to the Father except through Jesus. That is the plan. That is in God's plan for the restoration of the relationship. That's the only way you can be restored into the relationship that God wants you to be restored to is by coming through Jesus Christ. John goes on and he preaches. He says, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latches of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water. Oh! I have indeed baptized you with water, but he, he that cometh after me, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. All right. Here's another change in the way God had a relationship with men. In the Old Testament, over and over and over, you will read, and the Spirit came upon thee. Never in the Old Testament do you read where the Spirit entered in thee. The Spirit always came upon thee. But now here in the New Testament, God has another plan. It's the same plan, just another step of it for his relationship between you and I. Not only is the Holy Ghost come upon you, it's going to be all over you. It's going to saturate you, and it's going to dwell inside of you. Amen. Wow. What a change. What a change. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. God is bringing someone new on the scene. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John and Jordan, and straightway cometh up out of the water. He saw the heavens open, Woo! and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Here he comes up out of the river. The heavens have opened. The dove has descended. The voice out of heaven, the Father, said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Where is the next place we find him? Mark 1, 12. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with, with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. This is called the temptation of Christ. 
I've read this many, many times, and, and I wonder, why? Why was Jesus immediately driven into the desert to be tempted of Satan? And the Lord gave me an answer. I'm not going through all the temptations that he had, but I'm going to skip on that. You might ask, why did Jesus have to go through this? I'm glad you asked. In God's plan, Christ would not only be our sacrifice for our sin, but would also be our high priest. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Lord. Lord. Go to Hebrews, the second chapter. Yeah. For verily, he took upon him the nature of angels. For verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, listen now, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brother, you and I, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest. Be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being <coughs> tempted. That's why he had to go to the desert. That's why he was tempted of the devil. He had to go through the temptation where he would be merciful and faithful to you and I because we are tempted. And therefore he understands and knows what we're going through and the temptations that we face. Therefore, he can be a merciful and faithful high priest as he goes to the Father as our advocate with the Father and pleads our case to the Father. That ought to make you happy. That ought to make you happy. Amen. Jesus went to the desert and was tempted of the devil where that he could be merciful and understanding with you. Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. Seeing then that we have a high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us, listen now, let us hold fast our profession. I do a lot of ministry on Facebook, but I see a lot of things on there. I see people that one day are praising God. The next day I see a post. I give up. I give up. What's this say? Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed unto heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. We ought not be up one day and down the next. We ought to have the same profession of faith every day. No matter what's going on around us. Knowing that God has us. We're in His hand. Amen. And the Word of God says everything works together for good to them that love God and according to His purpose. Oh, we may have a hard time. We may go through the valley. But God is with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. We need to hold fast our profession of faith. Amen? Amen. I know it's hard to do, but we need that. <laughs> Amen. You, you sang that little chorus today. It wasn't the same one, but it was about the same people. Uh, about two years ago, we were here, and uh, you sang about Paul and Silas in the jail. Yeah. <laughs> and while you guys were singing, I was sitting back there on that third row, and while y'all were singing, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. And the Spirit said to me, said, I wasn't punishing them that night, even though they received a beating, and they were in the dungeon, and they were in socks and bones. I wasn't punishing them that night, but here's the thing that drilled a hole in my spirit, and I built a sermon around it. I needed them in the jail that night. Amen. Because 
I love the jail. Yeah. <laughs> 